Wer ist für Datensicherheit verantwortlich? Frauen, Cybersicherheit und Homeoffice. Who is responsible for data security? Women, Cybersecurity and Homeoffice. Hi everybody, my name is Karma. My mother is a white German and my father is a black American. I grew up in the 80s on an island, which was a small and contemplative place. Everybody knew each other. The travel from end to end took an hour. And before you ask where I come from, usually I would answer this question in perfect German. I'm from an island called West Berlin. I'm a German. And this is something a lot of white Germans can't wrap their heads around. That's why the Black Lives Matter movement is important to have in Germany. So in my, in my mid twenties, I decided to do the most German thing possible and get a life insurance. My aim was to get out of lower working class and have retirement provision and to generate generational wealth. Therefore, I got a computer engineering degree. I worked at various tech companies, startups, NGO-like companies, and a German governmental IT agency, in IT administration and network security. For many years in my professional life, I've been perceived as exotic. My opinions and views were not taken seriously. I got tired of being treated poorly. Therefore, I founded the company Lacewing Tech, together with a business partner in the beginning of 2019. At the core of our business is data security and diversity. We want to create a safer space for diverse people of age, class, race, gender, and identity. So we all can be part of the IT community. Lacewing Tech is build, building up an ecosystem with a holistic approach to data management. We offer an open source cloud storage, including backups with several IT services like IT consulting, support and workshops. Additionally, we sell hardware with mainly handpicked open source software. Whenever we add a new product, we focus on usability, security and sustainability. So let's jump right into the next topic. Therefore, into the real world. We are living in a post-private era. Our data is no more private. The cloud is a virtual place where a bunch of data is stored. Additionally, it is used for collaborative work and many more things. But today we're going to focus on the storage part. Several different parties can access, store, share their data. Cloud storage is, is, is centralized. Everything is stored in one place. That means a third party is providing the infrastructure and has full control over it. A centralized structure has a couple of drawbacks. It is more prone to hacks, data leaks, and is a single point of failure. My personal advice would be, always have a copy of your data at hand. So what are we looking at? Two different ways of how the cloud is depicted. So where lies the focus here? On the left is an image of how companies usually advertise their cloud. Above is the cloud, below are several other devices connected to it. It suggests we can access the data from all different kinds of places and every item in the line is equal. Let's recap. The industry understands customer, need, customer needs perfectly. We are sold on the idea that the cloud is easy to use. It's intuitive, very convenient, cheap, or even for free, and has limitless storage. All of it sounds better than we're going back to, to our old, clunky, and slow media devices we've used in the past. So let's not get blinded by the bling bling and let's go back to reality and let's focus on the data flow. The image on the right shows the reality. We are feeding the cloud. We are feeding the cloud with our data. We don't own and control the data anymore. And we don't know what's done with it or by whom. 
we're li we are living in a post-private era. So what do we know? So what do we know now? Big tech companies are selling our data and using it for data analysis. To get it right, we think we are paying money for the cloud service, but our data is worth way more than the services we get. So if we really opt into this business model, we are the ones who should get paid for the data. When you don't have any other choice but to use big tech and they own all or most of our data, it's called data monopoly. We are all like te teenagers here. The tech companies, users, the internet is still so young. There are hardly any rules set in place. Tech companies are acting like teenagers. They are reckless. They are in a tunnel vision, self-centered, fearless, fearless of governments, of punishments, testing their limits, are rebellious, unpredictable, fast, faster than governments can set rules and boundaries in place. They are unattached and impatient. We, the users, we have been educated to be passive and to comply and not to think too much, too hard, and not to worry whether our actions have long lasting consequences. The internet doesn't forget a thing. So how does this teenager affect women? Women are penalized way harder than men by our society because of our social and moral values. Men don't face the same consequences as women do. They are forgiven way more easily and therefore have more freedom. Who remembers the guy in the text in the sex tape? Nobody recalls their name. Guys usually don't get villainized. There have been leaked sex tapes of Jennifer Lopez, Mel B, Pamela Anderson, Kylie Jenner, and the list goes on and on and on forever. And there have been nude pics of um, of Rihanna and many other artists. Next level of cyberbullying is revenge porn. Half of the list of people I mentioned was on voluntary, which falls into the category of revenge porn. Last year, the jealous ex-husband used the smartphone of US Congresswoman Katie Hill to release revenge porn. When, when women apply for jobs, after there has been a sex tape or a nude images leaked into the internet, it's way harder for them to get hired and find a job. One of the in first international cyberbullying cases was with 22 year old intern Monica Lewinsky, who got wrapped up in a scandal with a former US president. Her life has been deeply influenced by this event. Most people still know her name, although the scandal happened 25 years ago. Men don't have to play by the same rules as women do. Donald Trump's racist remarks, sex, mis sexual misconduct allegations, bribery allegations, saying stupid things, nothing seems to stick. He might even get rewarded for his actions with a second presidential term. How does this teenager affect marginalized groups? TikTok bans creators who mention Muslim oppression in China. WhatsApp ha has been used to surveil Uyghurs in China. Artificial intelligence is used in the US court system to predict future criminals and help with sentencing. The prediction has been proven to be biased against black and brown people and is deeply flawed. Siri and Alexa has been, have problems understanding accents in high-pitched voices because mainly white cis men have been programming the software. Big tech offers technology with hardly any safety for its users. With any, when anything goes wrong and breaches happen, additional security measures are put in place. 
as an afterthought. And that means less, secu- less freedom for everybody. Facebook has been used for cybercrime and tried to prevent it by introducing new security measures, like forcing ident- identification and registration of users with a phone number and ID. As a consequence, especially marginalized groups suffer most under these restrictions. So how does this teenager affect the society as a whole? In Egypt, the Mubarak government penetrates Skype encryption and eavesdrops on its activists' calls. Jeff Bezos from Amazon, his smartphone got hacked by Saudi Arabia with a Israeli software app called Pegasus. They extracted pictures of his private parts and tried to extort him. He is a man, so he wouldn't comply. He, he He didn't bother to even listen to them. Prior to the presidential campaign, Hillary Clinton's email server got hacked by Russia. The scandal hurt her chances of winning the presidential campaign. The US NSA wiretap Chancellor Angela Merkel's encrypted Blackberry Blackberry smartphone. The wiretap trashed the postal secret, which is part of the German constitution and is an attack on on the society and the democracy as a whole. So how does this teenager affect VIPs? Governments and VIPs have physical security and advisory for data security. So none of their information will get out. They know that these intrusive activities are continuous and are supported by big tech companies. They know that Any online usage can make them a target. So what can be tracked? Most people think, I have nothing to hide. So here's an excerpt of a friend's daily routine. Seven o'clock in the morning, the alarm and weather app is used. So now we know her wake up time and her location. At 7.30, Her jogging app is used. So now we know her BMI, weight, pulse, and fitness level. At 7.30, Google Maps is used for the jogging route. So now we know her jogging route and her location. At 8.30, she's done with preparing her breakfast and posts it to Instagram. So now we know her location, what she eats for breakfast in the morning, and with whom she's at the breakfast table with. At nine o'clock, she starts home office because her her company didn't provide her with a business laptop. She's now using her private laptop. And because of Corona, everybody's scrambling. So she's forced to install all different kinds of software on her for all different kinds of software for her company on her private computer, as well as all different kinds of conference tools because none of them are working perfectly. So now all different kinds of data is blasting into the internet. Not only the company data, but also her private data. At 12 o'clock, she is taking a break and goes to a cafe. She's on call, so she takes her business phone with her. Her, Now she's connecting her phone to the public Wi-Fi and automatically the company cloud is connected to her business phone. She serves the internet and and Facebook and Instagram. Did you ever have did you ever have the feeling your smartphone knows what you're thinking? Well that that might be true. Your smartphone hasn't been hacked. You've just been unknowingly sending everything what's needed to create a complete profile of you. The result of all these bits of data being collected and assembled by outside parties is that very private information becomes public. 
big tech might be able to predict health and medical conditions. You might be pregnant without knowing it yet. Create a um, psychological profile in which your health insurance might be interested in. Social, intimate relationships and sexual orientation, which might get you arrested in some places and your financial, socioeconomical position. So why companies care? Companies are afraid of data breaches. They don't want uncontrolled data to be leaked out into the world. Nobody wants their company secrets and traits released involuntarily. All different kinds of entities are interested in their data, from script kiddies, cybercrime, for example, ransomware, locking files with encryption, internal threats, employees having careless access to sensitive data, corporate espionage. A special form is Amazon's metadata analysis to displace their competitors in the blink of an eye. Government surveilling customers, which is a breach of trust, privacy, and constitutional law. The recently introduced privacy law, GDPR, in Europe is something companies are afraid of. They are worried they could get sued for leaked data, sensitive data. So how do breaches happen? Employees might not be careful while surfing the web or using tech. Employers not, not uh, teaching employees how to, how to use tech properly fail to hand out equipment like laptops and smartphones and they're, because they're lazy and it's too expensive. Employers not securing data transmission and storages. So what do we do in home office to protect our, or to protect our data and our company's data? You can do a couple of basic things. Don't use the public Wi-Fi only with a VPN. Put a sticky on your camera when it's in use, when it's not in use. Disable your microphone when it's not in use. Check your email for breaches with haveibeenpawned.com. Think twice how you share your data. So why should you care? Tech doesn't change our real reality. Typically, there's a gender and sexual power dynamic to such breaches like revenge porn. There's rarely a chance to explain or recover private data once publicly available in the, in the internet. We have all heard of TikTok creators who don't get credited for their dances or artwork. Imagine your song, movie, and artwork has been sto stolen. These technologies offer very little protection from bias of the real world. I would go as far as, say, as to say, the technology inherits our biases. Self-driving cars fail to detect dark-skinned pedestrians because these engineers mostly have been cis white men, not thinking of dark-skinned pedestrians. An AI ch chat robot goes berserk and turns into an and turns after a couple of days into a Holocaust denying misogynistic bully. And that's really, and that's kind of scary. So what can we do? We are in a world where we are sold on, on, on the convenience of always being connected. So how can we turn back the clock? Or at least how can we lessen the risk of harm? that is caused by sending and receiving data nonstop. In my vision of the future, my company Lacewing Tech would only provide IT services. The centralized cloud storage we provide as a product would be obsolete. Data wouldn't be stored by us or any other third entity. We would store our own data on a single powerful decentralized standalone device. Their storage is big enough for all of our data. 
this would be a single device like a smartphone or a wearable. Nowadays, a mid-range smartphone has more storage and memory than a common laptop. The internet it was inherently built to support decentralized architectures. But big tech companies' goal is to have everything centralized. You might ask, why didn't I start a decentralized tech company? I don't have deep pockets to invest in future tech, to build something up from scratch, which might or might not work in five to 10 years. Besides, we all can use allies right now to get things done. So let's take, let's take a look at the slide. It shows a decentralized network. It looks kind of messy and it's definitely harder to use. We have to put in more work and it's not self-explanatory. So what do we have to change about our actions to be able to use a decentralized network? We would have to learn. We would have to learn how to responsibly own and use our data. We would have to actively share and revoke our data. So if I would like to share a private picture with a friend, I can do that without worrying. And I can revoke the access to the picture at any time. So this person can't use it anymore if I don't want this person to have it. We would know who has our data and what is done with it. And this is how we can take back control of our data. At the moment, we are hardly using decentralized technologies. A step in the right direction is to get away from big tech companies and their cloud storages and to use similar and to use smaller, trustworthy clouds who take privacy seriously. We can all do something by participating and being active mem members of our community by sharing our knowledge and asking questions especially the stupid ones, and keep asking until we understand the answer. From this point on, we can limit the amount of data leakage. We are 10 to 20 years away from our future vision to have a decentralized standalone device. But how the big tech is planning it is with a man in the middle. They want to keep us blasting involuntarily data out into the open for everyone to see. Big tech doesn't trust us, the users, to be able to deal with a more difficult infrastructure. They want to keep us simple. They want to keep us uneducated and they want to keep us in the mind state of a teenager. If tech is a teenager, we have to be responsible like parents and use password managers and encryption, own our data. Educate, educate ourselves how to deal with data. Data is collected everywhere at any time. Decide what is done with our data. Don't just hand it over to big tech companies. No man is, a, in, is an island. We need each other to form a robust and, tr and tr trustworthy structures and networks and find allies, trusted structures, networks, and companies. We need entities to evaluate the trust, write reviews and recommendations. That's what my company is consulting on. Share your knowledge. You're not alone. We are all dealing with the same problem here. For now, there's a choice. Together we can shape our future to have access to a mature, diverse cloud landscape and a future with a big tech-free decentralized network. So, so who is responsible for our for so who is responsible for your data security? It's not a company. It's not your parents. It's you. Thank you for listening.